Okay, so before we start, I just posted the assignment, the first assignment for next week, Wednesday. So you have some conceptual questions and quantitative questions. So I highly recommend that you find a study group. And for the first attempt, you really try to do it without looking at the solutions. For the second attempt, if you get stuck, you have a tutorial in the Dropbox where I go step by step for most of the problems. Is that clear? In addition to that, the unit in your textbook is chapter 21. So I recommend um, that you start reading about it, especially Coulomb's law, electric field, electric force. They have very nice solved problem. And I told you, you can find the book, I mean, you can hand the book and you can uh, use an old edition, doesn't matter, but it's very well written. And when you get to the solve problem, they really take you step by step. So it's a very good preparation for um, the test, test number one, that will cover mostly electrostatics, including capacitors, that uh, is the unit coming next. Okay, so chapter 21 in your textbook. Okay, um, what else for, for the assignments? I keep the last grade, not the highest grade, but the last grade. If you need an extension, you can shoot me an email, but try to go by the deadline, try to make some connections around you. You know, you have to work in a group. That's the best way to succeed, to pass the class and prepare you for engineering if you're an engineer student. Okay, so talking about conceptual questions, um, there is one question in the assignments. I want to make sure uh, you get that right. Before 1940s, 1947, before they came up with the transistor here that revolutionized the computers, electronics, okay, it was the beginning of integrated circuit in the 1960s. Before that, they used actually CRT. So CRT stands for cathode ray tube. So it was very bulky. So why did they use that? Because you can control the flow of current. Okay, so the current can flow or stop. So you get still one zero zero one one, but it was very, very uh, bulky. So that's why the computers were so huge. And then transistors, semiconductors came along. And that's how we have those uh, tiny um, laptops that we use our tablet. And they are much more powerful than those very bulky computers of the 1940s. Okay? So I wanted to make sure that was understood. The other thing, the last time we stopped here, and I think there was one question for the pop quiz today, the ratio between the size of the nucleus, okay, the size of the nucleus and the distance to the first electron, so the first uh, layer, the, the, the first shell, okay, is a ratio of 100,000 for small atoms. Okay, so that means the distance to the first electron, the ratio between the distance to the first electron to the size of a nucleus is about 100,000. If you have larger atoms, the ratio will be about 10,000 because as you add more electrons, it's going to be more squeezed, right? Because electrons are attracted to the protons like the nucleus. Okay, because I, I know there is somewhere a question about that, so I wanted to make sure you get it right. So this model here is called the Bohr model. So we discussed that before. And the Bohr model is just the nucleus here, electrons on energy shells, that you learn about that in chemistry. The reality is not quite that, and you all take a chemistry class, so you know about that. Actually, it's all about probability. So for example, this electron, if it's not excited, we have a higher probability to be found here, so it's like a cloud. And if it's excited, then the probability to be found will be there. So we get into quantum physics, which is not the topic of this class, but 
I wanted to, to make sure that you understand this. Okay, so what else did I miss? Okay, so charge are quantized. So anything that is charged will be an integer number of the fundamental charge, which is the charge of an electron equals the charge of a proton. The unit is the Coulomb, named after Charles Coulomb, okay, who was French, by the way. So only another thing that you have to remember, only electrons can move, okay? Either you have two insulators, so in that case, if you are doing work, you can transfer electron from one insulator to the other one, or they are conductors, so in that case, for example, if you apply a voltage, electrons can move. So if an object loses electron, it will become positively charged. If it gains electron, it will become negatively charged. Okay, um, so distribution of charge everywhere in engineering, in chemistry, in science. So for example, water molecule is what it's called polarized, okay? So polarization, we're gonna talk about it very soon. It means that one side tends to be negative because oxygen has affinity for electrons. So it's like taking the electrons away from the hydrogen and the hydrogen become positive. So this is negative and that side will be positive. So that's what we call a dipole. Okay, it's very important. That's why, you know, water is the universal uh, solvent, right? Because it's a dipole. So in chemistry, many molecules are dipoles. Okay, so what else did I miss? 19, okay, so we have seen that. So everything is quantized. So let me ask you something. If you have an object charged with one Coulomb, so one Coulomb, so it means it's positively charged with one Coulomb. So it means it's missing electrons, right? Can you find how many electrons are missing using that equation here? Can you do quickly the computation? So one Coulomb equals, it's always an integer because charge is quantized times the fundamental charge, which is the charge of an electron. So can you do the, Computation, very quickly. It's not working. You have to use the mouse. No, the connection's not, oh. it's not working. It's not working? There is no uh, internet? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, well, it's not private. I, I will fix it. When we're gonna get to problems, uh, uh, yeah. So one coulomb. So imagine you have, let's say you have like, a, I don't know. This this will not be possible, but let's say this is possible that you have so many positive charges on a van graph generator. Okay, let's say the charge here is one coulomb. This is not possible because one coulomb is a huge, 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 huge charge. So how many electrons are missing, okay? So you have one equals integer number. The fundamental charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. Okay, so you take your uh, TI. I lost my TI, it's supposed to be here. I don't know why it is. Okay, my TI is gone. So you have to do that on your own. So what do you get? So with your TI, you use the um, inverse reciprocal. So you take the reciprocal of that and you don't stare at the screen. Staring doesn't help. So you get your calculator, you do it. More you do it, more less you have to do at home and less complain you will email me. And you get? 6.25 to the 18th. Very good. Okay, electrons. So 10 to the 18, that means you're gonna have six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, blah, 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 18. So it's uh, all numbers. So everything is quantized in that case. 
Okay, so we already talked about conductors, uh, insulators, conductors, insulators, semiconductors. So I'm going to go skip that. Okay, so the fun part, the only fun part of the unit is about understanding electrostatics, and you do have conceptual questions in, um, in the test. So here is my demo, so I don't know, I, I try the web, uh, the, the, the thing here, but it doesn't work. So what you have here, can you all see, even though you are over there and doing something else, I see that some people are doing something else, it's fine. Uh, it's called an electroscope, okay? And you see that there is a part here that can move. Do you see here, it can move freely. So that device was used to measure the amount of charge, okay? So there will be a proportion between the angle it's moving, okay? Uh, the, the angle it's swinging out and the number of charges, right? So how do we do that? So if I take a balloon, so balloon or ebonite, so on uh, here you have ebonite. Ebonite is some kind of plastic. I am the only one to do demo, okay? So please uh, bear with me and be patient. And, and you have to use fur of wool. So between, and that's a conceptual question typical, okay? So if you take a balloon and fur, the balloon has more affinity for electrons than the fur. So it means if I doing work like this, okay? Electrons will be transferred from the fur to the balloon. Once the electrons are here, can they move because they hate each other or they cannot move? They can't, right? They cannot. They can't because it's an insulator. So if you transfer electrons on a metallic sphere, electrons will be happy to move because they hate each other out, okay? They move away from each other. But if you do that with a balloon, it will stay wherever you put them. It can't, they can't move. So I'm gonna show if it works. Usually you do it with hair, but, uh, okay, so let's see if it works. Can you all see that? Do you see how it's repelled? It's very hard to convince the electron to move. Do you see how it has been deflected? It's hard today because uh, it's very humid outside. And when you have a lot of humidity, the, the charges tend to leak out. But, oof, do you see that? It's very hard to convince them to stay. Yeah, you see? Okay, you see how it's deflected? So why is it happening? Now the electron, they don't want to move on, on the rubber. Right? Do they want to move on that uh, needle? Yeah. Yes, because it's a conductor, right? So all the electrons are being pushed down away, okay? And, and now they uh, repel each other. Uh, the top will be positive. And then here it comes back because it don't want to stay. But you see, this is negative, this is negative, so they're going to repel each other. Okay, so now on that balloon here, I have been transferring electron from the fur to the balloon, and the electrons stay here. So uh, you can usually, if it works, if it's not too humid, that you are able to uh, stick the balloon here to the to the wall if it's not too humid. So anyway, so typical conceptual equation, when you rub fur and ebonite, electrons will move from the fur to ebonite or to the balloon, but they will stay wherever you place them. They are not able to move, okay? So another, uh, I have here simulation. Okay, so here you see, I'm gonna do the same thing. 
Now, can you see that the electrons, they don't move? Okay, so they're going to stick here because, of course, this is positively charged, this is negatively charged, but they don't move around. Now, something that is very important to understand is that you see those molecules, they are part of the wall. Can the electrons move away? No, because it's an insulator. However, you can have something called polarization. So it means if I bring the balloon close to the wall, I can push, I can push electron away. So that means in the molecules, even though the electrons are not free to move, they will still be pushed away. So that's called polarization. Polarization means you have a plus and a minus, right? So this uh, prayer is a conductor? So no, it's not a conductor, it's an insulator. But by rubbing two insulators together, you are doing work. So you are forcing the electron to be transferred from, from the wall, from, from the wool, from the sweater to the balloon. However, once they are here, they are not going to move. They're going to stay glue here. It's very hard to get rid of them after that. And if it was a metallic sphere, okay, and I put a charge on a metallic sphere, then they will spread out away from each other. So, for example, uh, in the fun, uh, uh, the fun thing we did uh, last time, So you see here, he's rubbing his shoes, but the electron don't stay here like the balloon because the body is a conductor. So the electron will try to spread out and move on the outside. So something we're gonna learn, charges, always move on the outside of a conductor, never stay inside. So maybe you have been to a museum where you have people inside a cage, a metallic cage, and uh, they are, uh, there, you, you did see that? There is lightning and they are safe if they stay inside the cage because the electrons all know, cannot go inside the cage, always moving outside the conductor. So electrons move on the outside of the conductor and they are unhappy. So if it's very humid like today, they will leak out, but they always try to find a path to the ground. Exactly. And boom. So here the voltage, even though you are not electrocuted, nevertheless, the voltage is so large that it will, it will ionize the air. Okay, so it's not the voltage that keeps, is the current. Okay, so this is called an electroscope. And uh, the thing to remember is that typical question, conceptual question, if you have fur and um, uh, rubber or ebonite, okay, the, the electron will be transferred from the fur to the ebonite. If you have silk and glass, it's the opposite. Silk has more affinity for electrons than glass. Okay, so if I ask you a question, you will be able to answer. So at the time when they didn't have the charge of an electron, because that was found in 1910 by Millikan, but nevertheless, they were able to do those experiments that I did today, but it's a cheap electroscope, okay? It doesn't work that well, but uh, if you have an electroscope, then they were able to measure the relative charge of object. More charge means more deflection. And that was done in the 19th century. For demo, you know, you can build your own uh, electroscope. That's not hard. If you have hair, I see that everyone has hair. Not that hard to do. So you can do that. Of course, you all know that negative charge, unlike charge, what do they do? They attract or repel. Um, uh, unlike, positive and negative. Attract, right? It's like a magnet, south and pole, and like charge will repel. So I'm going to try to do an experiment. So I don't know that my experiments not always work. Um, if I remember. 
something just fell. So here, you see, I have silk. I took the silk, the, the, the tie. It's a tie, but it's made of silk. And this is like um, ebonite, okay? So I'm going to rub it. So it will become what? Positive or negative? Tie will become negative. Very good. Tie will become negative. So the, the plastic rod will become positive, okay? So there is a transfer of electron. And uh, I'm going to put that here. Okay? So I'm going to do the same thing with this one, the same. Okay, so it will become also positive. Positive. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, and what do you think is going to happen? It's going to push it away. Uh, you see? You see what you see here? It's called the force at a distance, right? It doesn't need to touch it to be uh, acted upon. Do you see that? So there is two ways to understand that. You can take the approach of Newton and say, okay, it's just a force at a distance. The charge here, grab those charges and push them away. Or you can say that because they are both charged, this one is producing an electric field. This one is producing an electric field and they are pushing each other. Okay, but we're gonna see that next. But you see how it's repaired? So if I keep doing that, if there is a force according, according to Newton's second law, there is an acceleration, very good. Now, if instead of taking a silk, now I take a glass, yeah? So that will be uh, negative. So with this glass, glass and fur is supposed to be positive now. The glass, Glass is positive. It depends which material you are using. Oh, look at that. Isn't that an amazing experiment? Huh? Isn't that cool or what? It's very, very cool, right? So you see there is an um, angular acceleration and we can do all, all those uh, computations. Well, the rod itself was positive, right? Positive. Uh, this one is positive, so this one is negative. negative you're right. Yeah. Negative. Negative because the fur doesn't like electrons, so it says take it away. Revert the charge to what it was by letting it sit. Oh, that's a very good question. How can we get rid of the charge? Um, once it's there, it's very hard to get rid of it because it's glued to, to it. So the, the only way you have is to try to do this. You ground it, right? So I'm grounded to the ground. So electrons will, uh, will come. So if it is positive, electrons will come from the ground and try to combine with the positive. But it's very hard. That's an issue in engineering. Once the charges are on an uh, insulator or inside, it's very hard to get rid of it. And I have to keep that in a plastic bag because of um, because it's very humid. How come then, if I rub the balloon in my hair, stick it on the ceiling, it takes like maybe a minute for it to fall down? But it it depends. Um, if if you rub it against your hair, your hair become positive or negative? Positive. Positive. Okay, because the balloon takes the electrons. So. Uh, positive and opposite will repel each other. However, if it's very humid and, and so it will tend to leak out. So it depends on the weather. Okay, um, that's slide 23. So for example, if you have a plastic rod, um, you, you rub it with wool, so the plastic rod will become negative, very good. 
you touch a sphere, but it's a metallic sphere. Okay, so it means you have a sphere here covered with aluminium. Okay, and now you have your rod, which is negative, you touch here. What's going to happen to the electron? Do they stay here or they are happy? It's a conductor, so they're going to spread out. Spread right out, very good. Nothing inside. And so if you have your negative sphere and your negative rod, bringing them together, what's going to happen? We repel each other. You see that? So I can try to show you that here. Uh, so I have like, it's called, a, you can buy it. It's very cheap. It's a, called a fly stick. Okay, it's a, it's a toy. But it's actually a static machine. Okay, can you hear? There is a little motor. So it's going to bring the electrons here. So that part is going to be charged uh, negatively. Actually, we don't know if it's positive or negative. It's like a Van Graaff generator. We, we never know if it's going to be positive or negative. The point is that there will be a separation of charge. One side will be negative, say. The other side will be positive. So here I have a conductor, so it's just a piece of aluminium, and I want to show you polarization. So I'm not going to touch it, right? I'm going to bring it close to it. Do you see how they attract each other? So this is polarization. It becomes a dipole. So if this is negative, okay, all the electrons here are going to be pushed away. So that part will be negative, and this one will be Okay, so this is called polarization. Okay, it won't stay because uh, I'm touching it with my hand, so the electrons go through me into the ground. Now, if I touch it, then it will become, if I touch it and if it's aluminium, so it's a conductor, it will become. Um, Oh, if it's negative, it will become negative. So what's going to happen to them? Should, should be repelling each other, right? So you see what you can do. It's very hard to convince it. OK, that's what you can do. <laughs> but uh, you, can, you can play with it. Uh, Ah, almost. Ah, here you go. You see that? Isn't that nice? So as as soon as it's touched, ah, Tom, why why are you laughing? Is that so funny? No. Um, I mean it's it's great. Uh, once it touches the ceiling, it's gonna be discharged. Okay, so that's how it works. Now, as I've uh, said, if you touch a conductor, all the charge here okay, will spread out. Can we find charge inside, inside the conductor? No, okay, always on the outside. Okay, so we'll talk about that because that means uh, it's gonna be um, the next unit. But I can show you that here. Okay, so this is now it's a conductor. Now if I charge it with it, ooh, do you see that? Can you hear the noise? Yeah. And it, it it can hold the charge. Now it's holding the charge. So this is let's say this is all negative. Must be a positive somewhere. So positive comes from the ground choo, 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 into my hand. So I have negative and positive. So that's what we call the, start with a C, ca, capaci, capacitor, right? It's like the Leyden jar. It's a way to hold charge. If I have enough charge and I make a connection between plus here and minus there, I can make a spark. You see, it's, it's holding, but it's leaking out because it's so humid. I can do that also with a, uh, you, you can go and uh, uh, shock people. So if I charge here, this is an insulator. 
I can put some charge. And if you put your finger, let's see if it works. No? Okay. Let's see. Uh, it depends if we have. Let's try. No? Well, anyway, in theory, you can uh, um, charge. You, you can show people. Okay, the other thing that I wanted to show you is called charging by induction. Okay, so it means if I take my electroscope, look at that. I'm not going to touch it, right? I'm just bringing close to it. Uh, you see how it's being pushed? It's supposed to be pushed away. So sometimes it doesn't work that way, especially if it's humid, but um, you get the idea. So this is called charging by contact. Okay, so this is a Van Graaff generator. We're going to talk a lot about it. And one fun experiment that I used to do with my students, um, but it was a smaller college, so we had this um, device, it's called a Van Graaff generator. And you see, you have someone, but do you think that person can be on the ground or that person has to be isolated from the ground? Isolated, right? So that means that person has to stand on a chair or has needs to have very thick uh, shoes. Usually standing on a chair, not touching the ground. So that person will be totally safe because uh, all the negative charge or positive charge will go in her body and you see it brings the hair up, right? It's like a living electroscope. She, she won't feel a thing because she's not connected to the ground. However, the fun thing that we used to do in class, but I have too many students and they don't have that in the, the department. So I bought a lot of things for this class, but this one is too heavy to carry. But then if she touched someone, what will happen? Exactly, there will be a spark. And then we make a human chain. So it was so, so fun. Um, is it dangerous? No. Because even though the voltage can be huge, like I'm talking about thousands of volts, 2,000 volts, the big one can be 10,000 volts. However, it was not dangerous, even though the current goes through you, so the charge will flow through you once you touch someone or touch the ground. Why? Why it would not be dangerous? Because so you are you are to the ground, but I guarantee that if you put your fingers in the outlet, even though I am connected to the ground, it goes through my heart and my heart will contract and I will be dead and I will have to find another physics professor, right? But that's not the case here. So you still have current going through you, but it won't kill you. A friend who's home is struck by lightning and was in the shower when it happens. Can you explain why they might not have been injured by that? They, they were not injured? No. It depends if he was isolated. Yeah. Okay, if there is no path to the ground, or if there is a path to the ground, but yeah, if there is a way. So, for, for example, here, if you look at the outlet, you have three holes, right? You have the hot, the return path, and you have the ground. So, any device, if you have a leakage of current, it will always try to find a way to the ground. So if it doesn't go through you, it means either you are isolated or you found another way to the ground. Yes. Wait, um, I don't know if you're saying like it goes around the surface of conductors, but can you explain why it goes through you for human stuff? No, because then then you have as long as there is a path to the ground, okay, electrons want to flow to the ground. So you you will be uh, there will be an electric current going through you. So when you're not connected to the ground, it just goes on the surface? Yes, very good. So that's a good point. So it means the bird, you know the high tension wires, okay? The, 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 the wires are not insulated. They don't have rubber around it because it will cost too much money. And the bird, they are okay, okay? You don't see a bird going on the wire and being fried and fall on the ground. 
right? They are charged, okay? So they're gonna be high voltage, but as long as there is no path to the ground, so that means as long as they don't touch the other wire, which is return path, they will be okay. So if you were to stand on the high tension wire, like hanging there, you will be okay, as long as there is no path to the ground, okay? So why is it, even though it's a thousand volts, so this is 120 volt, okay? If I do that, I die. But in that case, I don't die. Why is that? No, because low current, low ch ch charge, okay? So there is very, very little charge that you're gonna place here, like nano coulomb, like 10 to the negative nine. And what kills is the current. So a very small current can kill you because it go for your heart. Your heart is an electrical system and it will contract, right? So that's why electricians some, sometimes they have their hands in their pocket where um, they have like a metallic thing so for the electron to find a path to the ground without going for their heart. Okay, is that clear? So I have a video, I don't want to put too much time on the video, but this is a very famous on video. On the ground, <laughs> Walter Lewin. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna accelerate. What is going to happen with me? Through induction, the electrons being sucked out of the earth and coming up because they wanna go close to the positive charge. So I will become negatively charged. What will the field lines do? Oh, they will be extremely complicated. Very complicated, but uh, so I like take off relatively slowly when it hits the flow. No, that's not the one. Um, living capacitor, no, this one. Okay, so this capacitor here You're is ready? huge. Okay, it's not even the one I used to have. This one is like a 10,000 volt that you make. You see how huge it is? Are you nervous? So you can make a huge lightning between here and there. See you. He's a very good actor as so well. So look at so the tinsels. Why, why is he stepping on here? And try not to look at me, please. <laughs> from the ground, right? So it'll be Go ahead. okay. It's not going to be sh uh, shot. See? I am now a living electroscope. <laughs> if, the, um, if the weather is cooperating today, and if I had long hair, you might even see that my hair would st start to act like an electroscope. We can try that too. Why don't you throw it? <laughs> Is it working? Okay, well this weekend make sure you take this nylon shirt off in front of the mirror and enjoy your, enjoy the experiment. So he's very famous to have those amazing uh, demo. Very few professors will do that. And plus when you get shocked, it's, it's not very pleasant. It's not dangerous, but it's not pleasant at all. Uh, maybe you have seen that on TikTok, okay, for so example. Okay, so we discover like, look, look. And, 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 and then, and then. So that means if the if you have a weather that is stormy, okay, the electric um, charge is all over the atmosphere, and your hair will become charged, and it, it will um, do this. Very dangerous because uh, the storm you can have lightning, and it will be happy to find something charged on the path to the ground. That's how. Yeah. So. So not a good idea, right? So here is an experiment you can do. Yeah, capacitor, you can see. 
to to um, that that that's why that's what uh, Benjamin Franken did, right? He had the capacitor, so he was able to hold that. But you have to be isolated from the ground. Um, you see the same experiment here. Very cool. Another thing to do with a Van Graaff app generator. So you see, you have pencil. So it's it's a it's a pencil drawing. So it's made of gra graphite. So graphite is what? Conductor or insulator? Conductor, right? So what's going to happen is going to discharge here because it's going to find a way to the ground. So you have to crank it. Do you see the lightning? Isn't that cool? So each time you see lightning, it means that the sphere is discharging. It's losing its charge. And then you have to crank again to charge it again, right? So this is called a discharge. The reason why you see lightning, it's because the voltage is so large, like a thousand volt, you're gonna ionize the air. And once the air is ionized, it will be like a conducting path for charges to go into the ground. You said humidity is bad for... Yeah, humidity, because you have little water drop and the charge will uh, go on the little drops. It, it will leak out. I usually associate a lightning storm with humidity. So that's true also, but the, the, the reason why it makes a path to the ground, it's because ionization. Uh, let's see what else. Well. Okay, the last thing I wanted to show you, maybe I will uh, uh, keep that for next. Okay, so this is called polarization. So maybe when you are in school, you know, you have this very cool little demo. So this is not charged. However, they will attract you. They will be attracted to something made of uh, plastic because the plastic will be um, against your hair, so it will become what? Negative or positive? Negative. So it will attract those pieces through polarization. Okay? So that's called polarization. You can charge by induction. So like I was trying to do, it didn't work that well. So this is negative here. You bring it close. You don't touch it. So this side becomes positive, this one becomes negative. You touch with your finger, you touch this side, so all the electrons go back to the ground and it becomes positive. So if you are interested playing with electrostatics, there is something very famous called the electrophorus. And you see before people uh, were not as sensitive as now. So the experiments uh, were done with uh, what <laughs> can you see what it is a cat a cat fur right um, or a rabbit fur but now people freak out so we have to use less effective uh, wool <laughs> but you can you can watch the video here to see how an electrophorus works okay so about the van graaff generator so it was invented in the 1930s at MIT, so MIT is holding the patent, and then they donated it to Fermi Lab, okay, because um, that machine can generate a huge voltage, like maybe now it's 100,000 volts, okay, it's huge, someone here is tiny, so it's huge voltage, so it was used to accelerate ions like accelerate protons and smash them together right so if you have a voltage you can accelerate electrons or you can accelerate protons and they did all kind of experiments now it's not enough anymore so it's been phased out i mean retired and they have different ways to do it today but nevertheless if you go to boston uh, uh, and at the science museum the Van Graaff generator were donated uh, to them. They built another one and they do this uh, crazy demonstration. 
So this is called the Valgar Half Generator, an amazing invention. Nowadays, in um, research, you still use them, okay? It's still used for uh, research. Okay, so let's go to quantitative stuff. Coulomb's law, of course, repel, um, at, uh, same charge will attract, unlike charge will repel. And can we say if Q2 is larger than Q1, so that's a charge measured in Coulomb, can I say that this force will be larger than that one, according to physics one? No, right? Because of Newton? Third law, you cannot push more than you are being pushed, okay? And you cannot be pushed more than you are pushing. So for action, reaction, even though the charges are not the same, the force will be always the same. So when we're going to solve problems, we only uh, highlight one charge and see what's going to happen to it. So of course, guess, remember from physics one, when we had M1 and M2, so two masses, and they were attracting each other. So that force, the gravitational force, depends on what? M1, M2, multiply, and over the distance square, okay? So it's an inverse square law. So same thing here. So if you take those two charges, Right? So they want to be together, but you are holding them in your hand. And that is the distance between them. If you multiply the distance by two, the force will be divided by four. That's what we call inverse square law. If you multiply the distance between them by three, so one, two, three, the force will be divided by nine. Very good, okay? So if you bring the charge together very close, distance is divided by two, then the force is multiplied by four, okay? And you work the same thing, the same way for a uh, charge. So it's exactly the same anatomy. So the electric force, the magnitude between two charges, Q1 and Q2, is equals to the product of the charges divided by the distance between them square. And here you have a constant, except that constant here is the electric constant is nine times 10 to the nine, and it's a huge constant because the electric force is uh, huge uh, compared to the gravitational force. That's why you know you can do this. You can easily challenge gravity so the electric force is what is holding us together, right? So for historical reason, you have K, the electric force, which is also written as 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, and that's the value for epsilon 0, okay? It's just notation. So maybe you already have uh, printed out the equation sheet, and you have that, those two constants. Okay, so the charge, um, the, the, that constant here was measured by Coulomb, and it was, uh, his experiment was the same as the one done by Cavendish, who, who measured the constant for gravity, and he was able to measure the constant for um, electricity. It's a very simple experiment. You have a wire here, Okay, that you can, it's like some kind of fiber that can be twist, okay? Um, and uh, so if this is positive and this is positive, for example, they're gonna repel each other. So you're gonna have a twist and the force will be proportional to the twist, okay? The angle, it's make makes sense. It's called the torsion, a torsion balance. It's easy to understand. So anyway, that was done in the late 18th century. So a few words, very important to understand that about the inverse square law. You always have conceptual questions about it. You see, uh, light, for example, obeys uh, inverse square law. So it means the energy here, the amount of light spread out 
in 3D. So it means that the amount of energy here that you're going to collect or the amount of light, so let's say you have a sensor, okay, it's going to be the same here if you multiply the distance by 2 from the source of light, the same amount of energy will spread out over 4 times the area. Does it make sense? Okay, you don't need to take advanced math. It makes sense. Ask your girls, right? So in that in that um, area, that unit area, you will have four times less light. You multiply by three. In that area, the light will be divided by nine. Does it make sense? So it's called the inverse square law. Works for any field. So I'm going to introduce the concept of field. For example, if you have a piece of uranium and it's going to decay, so you're going to have radiation being emitted, okay? And it works exactly the same way. So if you multiply by two the distance from the piece of uranium, you will be exposed to four times less radiation. Gravity, same thing. You see, you are at a distance one radius, okay? So that's the, the radius of the Earth. Your pound is 400 pounds. Now you go here twice the distance. So your weight will be 100 pounds. Okay? Three times the distance, it will be divided by now. So if you do the math, it's called the inverse square law. And that's how the electric force works. Okay, so let's see. Uh, you have two charges, they attract each other. If, um, oh, so can you try to do this? It still doesn't work, the thing? Oh, it's working. Okay, so you can take attendance. So try to do that. So the force is proportional to Q1 times Q2 divided by the distance square. See? So what's happening? Both charges are double. So this one is multiplied by 2. This one is multiplied by 2. And the distance here is multiplied by 2. But the distance is multiplied by 2. So what's going to happen? So on the top, you multiply by 2, but at the denominator, if the distance is uh, doubled, the force is the same. So the force is the same. So answer is C. Does it make sense? Okay. If you are not convinced, if you have a hard time with that, what you can do, you give yourself fake numbers. So it's say, okay, let's say Q1 is one coulomb, uh, Q2 equals one coulomb. The distance between them is one meter. Okay, so you find the force, which is uh, one newton. So what's going to happen if you take Q1 equals two coulomb, Q2 equals uh, two coulomb, and the force equals two meters? Okay. And, uh, that's one way, that's one trick. I don't have to worry about the constant here because the constant is not involved. We just want to find ratio. So it's a ratio that means you divide. Okay, so it's uh, for engineers, it's important to understand that. Okay, so let's try to do that. So this is um, a hydrogen atom. Of course, this is simplified a lot. We are not taking into account uh, quantum physics. We just say, Oh, the electron, everything happens like it's orbiting the proton. It's not that simple, but it's just a, a simplification. So you want to try to do this one? So you can, uh, you, you can talk, okay? You can uh, help each other, talk to each other. Uh, the speed, okay, so what's happening here, you have a force, okay, so they attract each other, and 
What kind of force is that? So this is the electric force? Centripetal. Exactly. It's a centripetal force because it's perpendicular to the velocity. So remember centripetal force? It wants to keep going in a straight at a constant speed. No, you can't. Okay. You have a force to keep it on track. So there is an acceleration. And that acceleration equals the centripetal acceleration. So from physics one, I hope. You didn't erase your memory. Okay, so the acceleration, sorry, is V squared over R. So the force, Newton's second law equals mass times acceleration. Okay, so the force, the electric force equals the mass of the electron times the speed squared over R. So you can do uh, you can do the computation. Let me know what you find. So nine times ten to the nine uh, Q one is the mass the charge of an electron so one point six times ten to the negative nineteen. The mass of a proton it's gonna be the same thing so I'm gonna put a square here divided by uh, the distance is given 5.29 times 10 to the negative 11. And then here there is a square equals two. So that will be the force. You can find the force first and then in the second step, you can, um, you can find V square. So the mass is nine times 10 to the negative 31. And then D square, and then you have that distance again. So I don't know where is my TI, but you can do that on your own. You see, you can cross this out. You isolate V square, and then you take the square root. So let me know what you get. Is that clear? Simple algebra here. Okay, so what you do, you do this, enter times that, enter, uh, that square, enter, and then you divide by, open the parentheses, always put the parentheses around denominators, enter, and then you divide. Yes. Where did you get the mass value from? Here, here. The mass of an electron. Oh, so would it be the 9.7 to the negative 31? Uh, yes, I didn't put that. Oh, you did. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, why is it square what? Uh, oh, because it's a Q, because the mass, the mass of a proton equals the mass of an electron equals 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 Coulomb. And there is a typo, it should be 1.6. So this is, you see, it's the same charge, except this one is negative, this one is positive. Does that answer your question? No. So the charge is, is the same. No, the charge is the same. Okay, so let's do F electric equals K. So nine times 10 to the nine, it's a constant, times the charge of an electron. What is the charge of an electron? Is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. What is the charge of a proton? Because you have Q1 and Q2 it's going to be also 1.6 times to the negative 19. And then here, you divide by the distance square. So if you want to do it step by step, it's better. Maybe it's better. So in that case, you're going to find, so if you do that, then there is a square here. If you do that, you find, what did you find? 8.2 times 10 to the negative 8 Newton. Do you all find that? Right? So that will be your first step. I, I, I had a TI, I don't know where it went. TikTok, TikTok everywhere. I want TI, I don't want TikTok. Where is my TI?
So it's somewhere. I have to add that. But I suppose you are, you know, we did physics one, so you should be able to find that. Did you find that? Right? Yes or no? Find the electric force first, and then you write that down equals to m v squared over r. So you do it in step by step. I got the forces 8.2 to the negative 8. Yeah. Okay. So that would be the first step. And then you find the speed. Okay, so that will be the electric force. The electric force is electric force is equals to the centripetal force, so m v square over the distance. So you have eight point two times ten to the negative eight. Okay, so you do it step by step. Equals the mass of an electron ten nine times ten negative thirty one, and then you have v square, and then you have a 5.29 times 10 to the negative 11. Okay, so now isolate V square. Make sure to frame. I, I wish I could use, uh, I don't know where is my TI. Okay, so what you get? 9.1 times 10 to the 22nd for the acceleration. Uh, no, here we are talking, okay. And then okay. You would, uh, so that will be your acceleration, and so v square over r. So then you isolate v square, and then you take the square root. So what do you get? Are you doing it? guys oh uh, so three about two i found 2.91 times 10 to the for v did you take the square root times 10 to the times 10 to the times 10 to the six okay hey you are in with calculus, you cannot, that's not possible. You need to know how to do it. I got the same. Yeah, everyone got the same? Yeah. Okay, so V square, you multiply both sides by the same thing. So it's gonna be 8.2 times 10 to the negative eight, okay? And then just a review of scientific notation, I guess, times 5.29 times 10 to the negative 11. Okay, enter. I hope I didn't do any mistake. Okay, then you divide by this. So you divide by, open the parenthesis, 9 times 10 to the negative uh, 31st. Okay, and then you take the square root. And you find one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, 10 to the six is the typical speed for electron. Are you all with us? Make sure you review scientific notation, adding vectors, by the way. So the speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meter per second. So you can find the percentage. Okay. Okay, so uh, you see here, each time I have textbook 20.1, that will be a solved problem. So that means you have to do at home. So in that case, you will have to do it at home. You see, it's a solved problem. So anyway, let's do something else. Let's say you have a proton and the electron, okay? You want to find the ratio between the electric force, okay? Uh, pulling on each other, and the gravitational force. 
So can you do that? So it means you have a proton and an electron. You want to find the force between them. And we already found it, by the way. Okay, the force between a proton and an electron in a hydrogen atom is about 8.2 times 10 to the negative 8. Okay, and you want to find the ratio uh, to the gravitational force. So gravitational force is G times the mass of a proton, the mass of an electron divided by the distance squared. And you're gonna find out you have two ways to do it, but actually you don't need the distance because the distance is the same. Do you understand the question? Okay, let's do it again. Q1, let's say this is the electron, okay? And you have Q2, so let's say this is a proton, and you have uh, an electric force between them, and you have a gravitational force between them because you have a mass. Okay, so you have an electric force, so they attract each other, and you also have a gravitational force. Right. Okay, because this one electron has a mass of m1 and the proton has a mass of m2. Okay, so typical engineer uh, problems, not that hard. So the electric force is 9 times 10 to the 9, okay, times q1. Are you with me? So Q1 is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, times Q2, it's a proton, so 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, okay? Divided by the distance square, because it's an inverse square law. Are you with me? Okay, what is the gravitational force? That will be the constant, and the constant is uh, very small. Gravitational constant is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 11. You go back to my slide, or you look at your equation sheet that you are supposed to point out. What is the mass of an electron? 9 to the negative 35. Very Nine. good. And then a proton has about 2,000 times less mass it's here, 1.67 times 10 to the negative 7. So 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27. And then a distance square. OK? My question is, so don't stare at me, is what is the ratio between the electric force and the gravitational force? And actually, you don't need the distance. Because when you divide ratios, you multiply by the reciprocal. Very good. Very good. So you can do that. So do it because this is a um, like basic computation. Okay. So I take one. 19, I see that it's going to be square, so I'm going to put a square divided by the distance square. And because I divide by this ratio here, it's uh, multiplied by the reciprocal, boom, and then it's annoying computation. There is nothing special about it. It's super easy. I got a huge. Yes, it is a huge number. Okay, so that cross out, and you are left. You take your TI, 9 times 10 to the 9 times, open the parentheses, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 square, enter, divide by this, enter, divide by this, enter, divide by this, enter. You go step by step, and what do you get? 9 point times 10 to the 3, 9. Yes, so it's about... 10 to the 40. So what does it mean? It means that the electric force is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0
and that's why we have not uh, we have a finite shape and that's why your arms don't fall down because gravity is super super extra weak compared to the electric force okay so if if, if it's hard if you are i don't know um, if you have a hard time using your ti i'm available after the class but hopefully hopefully not any question yes okay so review scientific notation do problem 21.1 .1 from your textbook um before before uh, going and trying the homework let's try to do this one and that takes us back to physics one uh, how to add vectors so the first thing you want to do it says the force on q1 so first you draw okay first step you always draw so you have a uh, notation q1 q2 q3 that's already done for you then you put here the charge you look at your equation sheet micro means 10 to the negative 6 and once you have that it's almost done most important in physics is the drawing okay first you sketch or engineering same thing and then you highlight q1 so you isolate q1 so you take it like for your free body diagram and you say okay this one is plus this one is minus so do you agree that the force will be toward uh, uh, toward q3 yes okay plus minus will be this this way so you have right and then you have left and right is positive so adding vectors in 1d in that case you just subtract okay so try to do it the trick with those kinds of problems, the first thing you want to do is to find first the magnitude of the force. And then you deal with components. First, you find the magnitude of the force, and then you subtract or add or do cosine or sine. Okay? So don't stare. Uh, help each other, talk to each other, blah, blah, blah. And, and uh, collaborative learning so first you draw second you do a free body diagram with the object of interest and then you're going to find the magnitude only the magnitude okay first step you find the magnitude so it's just Coulomb's law, okay? And you, you want the notation one, two. So you are not making any mistake here, one and two, okay? So then you do nine times 10 to the nine, okay? Q1, so forget about the negative sign. So four times 10 to the negative six, uh, Q2. So this is Q2, Q1, three times 10 to the negative six, okay you have to convert um of course and here you're going to do a 0 0.2 square so you take your ti and you put uh, this number first right if you want me to use my ti i don't know where it went disappear again um, but i can do that so what do you get when you're using your ti scientific notation everything in parentheses okay so 9e9 enter times 4e minus 6 enter times 3e minus 6 enter divide by open the parentheses 0 0.2 square and you get i don't know if i got it right 2.7 newton you get that yeah right what's your name aj aj so you can do as many um use as you want in Coulomb's law. What do you mean how many Q? No, you have to do it uh, all, always work with two, right? So you, you, first you find the force between this, okay. then you find the force between this, and then you're gonna add the vectors. Okay. Okay? 
Do you want to use this? Um, no, I um, I have, I have. Thank you. Um, so one and three, we do the same thing. So what you get? Be careful here. Notations are very important, so you you don't lose your. Uh, you don't know which one is which. One. Minus six here. Only magnitude. So what do you get? Huh? Eight point four. Right? What's your name? Daniel. Daniel. Eight point four Newton. Right? And then you add vectors. Okay. So the vector sum. So here we are using the principle of superposition. You remember from last semester, adding forces, adding vectors. So uh, we decide that right is plus, left is minus. So I'm going to say right minus left. Okay. Where is the magnitude for the charge? Oh, it's here. That's fine. But you you have scientific notation. Oh, because micro. M micro, okay. So remember, micro Ten. is ten to the negative six. Nano is ten to the negative uh, nine. So because remember, one coulomb is huge. One coulomb doesn't happen. Uh, so it's always micro or nano. If it's nano, it's cool because then it you can cross out with the ten to the nine. So what do you get? So a uh, height is 8.4 minus uh, 2.7, and you get 5.7. Right? What's your name? Huh? 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 So if you want to make it uh, professional, because you are in uh, calculus-based, remember we have a unit vector. We can call that i hat. Okay, so the magnitude is just one. Show you that direction here. So we can say that the force is a vector. How much? 5.7 of what? Newton. Which way? i hat or x hat. Are we good? Sure. Any question? So I'm available after the class. So if you need a review for how to use your TI, whatever. Okay? Don't hesitate to help each other out. The best way to do it in this class is to connect with other students. Okay, and then it says textbook 21.2, 20.3 to do. Okay, so that means to do. That means you are supposed to do it. So uh, um, forces don't have to be along the x-axis or the y-axis. Now they can be in 2D. So now you have to remember how to add vectors from physics 1. So for example, if you have a vector A and a vector B, and you want to add them algebraically, Okay, using algebra. So you will have to find the x component of each vector. Okay, you add them, and then that will be the x component of the sum. Then you add the y component of the vectors, and if you add them up, that will be the y component of the sum. And then you use Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so I, I will do an example. So here, um, it's not numerical, it's just to show you how it works. So what you do, first of all, you highlight the object of interest, okay? So for example, here, you are asked to find the force acting on Q3. So you have to make a free body diagram just for Q3. And then you decide, okay, from this one is gonna be repelled, from that one is gonna be attracted, and then you need to add those vectors using algebra. Is that clear? And um, if, you, if you do the parallelogram method, you see uh, two, 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 two. 
no, I have to do it better than that. So you see that force will be in this direction somewhere. That will be the vector sum. And then you need to find the x component and the y component. Is that clear? If those charges are the same, so let's say this is one coulomb, say, and, and this is one coulomb, except this one is negative, that's what we call a dipole. Okay, so let's try to do an example here. Okay, so do it. Um, you can help each other. Um, different people have different uh, backgrounds, so help each other. We're not considering the forces between Q1 and Q2. So here it says, um, uh, fine for Q, uh, free body diagram. So what do they want? Forgot for Q1. Okay, so it means we want the force acting on Q1. So that means the free body diagram will be attached to Q1. Okay, free body diagram. What's going to happen to it? What's going to happen to Q1? That's the question you need to ask. What's going to happen to Q1? Is it going to be pulled toward Q3 or is it going to be repelled? Pulled. And what about from Q2? Also pull. So first thing, you do a free body diagram. And then you forget uh, that it's electricity, you just do adding vectors. So it's just adding vectors. But the first thing is to identify which one I'm uh, interested in. So help each other, talk to each other, nya, nya, nya. very important. So it's here, Q1. We want Q1, okay? And for those problems, it's good if you have color pencil, especially if you are in engineering, you know. Color pencil is very nice. So you see, it's attracted here. So first is the drawing, okay? Don't skip to the computation, you have to draw. And I'm going to give a notation here. I'm going to say, okay, it's one, three. So it doesn't matter if you do one, three or three, one, because for every action, you have a reaction. So it doesn't matter. And this one is also attracted. So I'm going to call that F one, two. Okay. And we are talking about a free body diagram so this is your x and this is your y okay and uh, i have to watch the time okay so first thing i recommend that you just find the magnitude first thing you find the magnitude and then we will deal with a cosine or sine or whatever first the magnitude okay so it's just coulomb's law so 9 times 10 to the 9, magnitude, forget about the negative sign. Okay, and here you have 4 times 10 to the negative 6. And then you have a distance square, which is 0 0.15 square. Okay, anyone did that? I got the magnitude for the forces. Okay, so which one? Of one to what do you get? For a Q, from one to two, I got 9.6. Very good, 9.6 Newton. Okay. I got 18, one to three. Very good, so one to, uh, so one to two, one to three. Okay, everyone is on board. Okay. Uh, then you have the force four times 10 to the negative six. And then you have a six here, no, you have a five times 10 to negative six, and then the distance with three. So notation, very important, so you don't, it's easy to get confused. And 18 Newton, is that clear? Okay, and then we have the X component and Y component. So you see, um, so F, uh, this one is easy, just have an X component, but this one, you see, has an X and a Y component. 
So it has a x component here, f sub x for 1, 3, and the y component here. So x component, how much of that force is along the x? y component, how much of that force is along the y? So this is the y component just for uh, 1, 2. Do you agree? Okay, so the x component for the sum of the vectors will be the x component of 1, 3, which is just 18, very good, plus the x component of that force here. So am I using cosine or sine uh, for the x component? Sine. No, cosine. Yeah, look here. Using the, the angle. Ah, okay, so if you are using this angle, so then you are right, it will be sine. Okay, so that will be 9.6 cosine uh, 73. Do you agree? And you get... Yeah, 20 something, right? Let's say 21 Newton, right? Don't forget the cosine. Uh, do you all agree? Yeah. Are you with me? So the Y component will be... Um, there is no Y component, so it will be only this. So it's going to be 9.6 sinus sine 73, which is 9.2 Newton, right? So the next thing you do, and don't skip this step, is to draw a x, y coordinate system. I'm, I'm going to draw the components. So it has a big x component here of 21. It has a small uh, y component of 9.2. So that's going to be my vector. So why do I do that? Because if you want to find the direction of the vector, it's easier. You have to draw. So you know which, which uh, angle you are talking about. OK? So how can we find the magnitude? Pa Pythagorean theorem. OK? So it's going to be the square root of uh, 21 square plus 9.2 square. And that's going to be uh, 23 Newton. Yes, everyone is with me? Yeah. OK, so that angle tangent, so tan alpha is opposite over adjacent. So that angle is going to be... Huh? 23 something, so let's say 24, that's uh, Daniel, 24. So the vector F is how much? 23 Newton, which way? Um, 24 degrees above the positive x-axis. So you go, you go this way, uh, this way. So this is 24. Okay, so it's a, it's a review. So it's possible, I forgot what is in the assignment. Maybe in the assignment you have the electric field. I'm, I don't think so. So you should be able to do the assignment. And uh, so we're going to have a pop quiz very soon. Um, at, do you see the pop quiz? At what time does it open? 11. So be ready for the pop quiz. So for the pop quiz, it's easy. I mean, it's based on the previous lecture. And the idea is to talk to each other, okay? To um, share your ideas or understanding, yes. Why? Uh, I guess not my axis. Well, what is it that the y axis what? Why was it? Just other y. Oh, because this one is along the x, so there is no y component. It, uh, yeah, it's along an axis. So if it's along an axis, there is... So in that case, you see it's along the x, so there is nothing of it along the y axis. So the y component is how much of the force is along the y axis, yes. Yeah, because I was calculating on here, on the TI calculator on the phone, 
And I just didn't get the right answer every time. Have, have you uh, looked at the mode? You must be in regions and not in degrees. How do I check that? I don't know. <laughs> okay, let me check my TI. So here, you have something called mode. This is way too small for me. If you have mode here. I'm on normal, normal right now. But the, no, you are in region. Look, you have to click on the race. Here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah, just oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Ah. Thank you. So I don't know if you remember, but last class, I remember when you were talking about introducing the passenger to the lady in Yeah. You mentioned.